This is a good move. Watch you dancing. Dancing is forbidden. Dancing is forbidden. Yoo-hoo, running crew, welcome to Dancing is Forbidden, an Aqua Teen Hunger Force exploration. I am Ronnie, and on this podcast, I am usually watching through and talking about every Aqua Teen episode, but this week, we've got something much more exciting going on because I had the honor and privilege of sitting down with Jay Wade Edwards, producer, editor, and voice actor on Aqua Teen. Before I go on, I need to tell you right now, you can find Jay on Twitter and Instagram at j wade edwards link to this and just everything else will be in the show notes go give jay a follow and if you like our conversation let him know i'm sure that he would like to hear from you so all right before we go any further there are a few bits of information that i need to leave you with so at one point we talk about the hat jay is wearing normally i would not have asked about this in an audio only podcast but you'll understand why we talk about it when you listen. It, it, it comes up in a fun way. To describe the hat, it's a really cool light teal color with a, an orange brim. On the front of the hat is a tiki-style Bigfoot head with fire in its mouth and a cross of logs behind it that are also on fire. So it's an extremely cool hat and something just so incredibly Jay. You would think he had this custom made for him once you learn a little bit more about him. And you can see this hat in this episode's artwork, and also there will be a pic of it in the show notes. So, you know, there's a few ways to see it here. It'll, it'll be on my Twitter and Instagram as well, at Aqua Teen Pod, of course. Next up, Jay and I had a really cool conversation on Obscure Records. I end up showing him one of my records, uh, Takashi Kokubo's Get at the Wave. The visuals aren't that important, but if you want to see what the packaging looks like, there is a link in the show notes. I am kind of showing him on my webcam what it looks like, and again, you don't really need to know what it looks like, but if you want to see it, the option is there. So, the last thing I want to say is you hear so many times, don't meet your heroes, and to that I say bullshit, because Jay was awesome, I loved talking to him, and that really goes for everybody who's worked on this show. I haven't ran across anybody being mean or rude or anything yet, everyone has been so cool, and it just makes makes me love this show so much more. So with all of that out of the way, let me tell you a bit about the man of the hour. J. Wade Edwards was born September 12th, 1968. Growing up in Florida, Jay spent most of his childhood either inside watching the Dick Van Dyke show and inadvertently learning about joke craft, or out fishing with his dad learning legends of the skunk ape, Florida's flavor of the Bigfoot or Sasquatch myth. Upon graduating high school, Jay left, or in his words, escaped, Florida for Alabama. Attending Auburn University, it was here Jay serendipitously fell in love with editing. While initially majoring in public relations, one fateful Sunday morning Jay took an editing class. Twelve hours later, Jay realized he had forgotten to eat, he had forgotten to pee, time just disappeared. The very next day, he changed his major to communications and decided to be an editor for a living. On graduating college in 1991, communications degree in hand, Jay moved to Atlanta, Georgia and got a job with a small post-production house. While doing odd jobs around the office that nobody else wanted to do, Jay was also learning the, at the time brand new, avid, non-linear editing system that was becoming the standard in post-production. Flash forward to the mid-90s, Turner Broadcasting, a production behemoth in Atlanta, was having issues managing their editing suites. This avid technology was seemingly too new and just too confusing. Enter Jay Wade Edwards to the rescue. Within about a year of proving his worth, Jay was set to work on an original production for Turner Broadcasting's Cartoon Network, a goofy superhero turned talk show program called Space Ghost Coast to Coast. As much as Jay appreciated his technical, promotional, and instructional work, he always wanted to tell stories. It was on Space Ghost that he was finally able to. While working on the show, Jay became acquainted with two writers on Space Ghost, Dave Willis and Matt Malero. 
A few years and many classic Space Ghost episodes later, Jay would be asked by Dave and Matt to leave his secure employment at Turner Broadcasting to become a freelance editor on their new project, a crime-fighting cartoon starring fast food products. This show was to be called Aqua Teen Hunger Force. The executives weren't crazy about it, but they gave the project the green light. While anyone in their right mind would turn down this proposition, the offered pay on the project, as well as the proven strength of the creative forces behind it, convinced Jay to make the move. Luckily for Jay, Matt, Dave, everyone else involved in the project, you listening, and me making this podcast, the move paid off. Aqua Teen was a success. Jay would go on to work on Aqua Teen for well over a decade as an editor and producer. Beyond this, Jay handled the special features on the DVDs, occasionally voice acted on the show, and produced many of the in-universe television shows we see on Aqua Teen, amongst many other responsibilities. Worth mentioning, Jay occasionally also had his hands in other Adult Swim programs, such as Squidbillies, C-Lab 2021, and The Brack Show. Eventually, Jay needed a change. After dedicating so many years to the teens, he made the move from Atlanta, Georgia to Los Angeles, California. Jay has since gone on to make shows for Disney, such as Gravity Falls and Wander Over Yonder. He's worked for Netflix on the animated series Kid Cosmic. Jay, of course, has not forgotten his roots and remotely worked for his buddies back at Adult Swim on Your Pretty Face is Going to Hell. In terms of Jay's upcoming work, he is involved in the upcoming film A Town Called Purgatory, directed by and starring Matt Servito of Sopranos and Your Pretty Face is Going to Hell fame. However, this is only half of Jay's story, and I think this is what makes him so interesting. This entire time, throughout his entire impressive career I've been describing, whenever Jay had any free moments not producing content, he liked to spend those moments producing his own content. Well, alongside indulging in his love of all things baseball and beer. In the late 90s, Jay produced his own set of monster short films called the Monster Trilogy. In 2005, Jay released his self-produced and self-financed feature-length film Stomp, Shout, Scream, a delightful mashup of the 1960s beach party and monster movie genres. 2016 saw Jay producing a gender-swapped retelling of classic films with his Kino Edwards picture show. In 2018, Jay released the first part to a three-part series called the Hat Trick Trilogy, all shot on his iPhone. And trust me, if I didn't tell you it was shot on an iPhone, you wouldn't have known. By the way, the vast majority of Jay's work can be found for free on his YouTube and Vimeo channels, links to everything in the show notes. This is just a small sample of Jay's colorful and passionate career. Jay is a creative. He's compelled to tell stories regardless of the production circumstances or even who sees them. It's his calling. It's this exact creative drive that brought us so many wonderful seasons of Aqua Teen Hunger Force, and it's because of Jay's creative drive that this podcast exists, and it's the reason we are here today. And by the way, Jay isn't done with Aqua Teen. All these years later, he still spends time with our favorite talking fast food products. Recently, Jay edited some of the 2021 HBO Max Aqua Teen promos, some 2022 Aqua Donk side pieces shorts, as well as having a hand in the upcoming 2022 film Plantasm. There are a handful of people I consider absolutely critical to the success of Aqua Teen Hunger Force. Jay Wade Edwards is on this list. Please enjoy our conversation recorded September 22nd, 2022. So my first real question for you here is explain to our listeners why you are now going by J. Wade Edwards over J. Edwards. <laughs> You've done your research. Yeah, I found that website and several hours and hundreds of dollars <laughs> later, I'm like, I don't think this is the right guy. What's going on here? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's it's kind of how I introduce myself is... Uh... Is that I let people know I'm Jay Way I'm Jay Edwards, but I go by Jay Wade Edwards. If you Google me, please know that JayEdwards.com is a bondage porn site, <laughs> and it's not actually me. So for like, and it's been that it like that's website's been around for t- almost twenty years probably, mm-hmm. and so you know as 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 I like I, I, I told one <laughs> I told one woman I was dating years ago about that, and she was like, yeah, it's okay, it's not the best, not the worst. <laughs> I like you. Uh, Anyway, um, so yeah, that's how I introduced myself is jedwards.com is not me. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, the internet is lazy. And that J. Edwards, who like acted in some porn films, then became a porn director and now runs this website. Um, 
he gets my credits all the time. Right. Or he used to, you know, so like he'll, <laughs> he, he has his porn credits and his uh, children's television credits, which are actually mine sometimes. Oh God. He, people are like, this is a very multifaceted man. He's in all That's sorts right. of things here. That's right. That's right. So I've, I've never met the other J Edwards. I, th- I, I think that's a New York, New Jersey or something based company, but maybe it's here, but uh, no, I've never, I've never crossed paths with anyone who, who, who worked in that side of the biz. I like to think you're not a- opposed to the bondage porn so much as his website looks like shit and it looks clearly like oh, it was made 20 years ago. <laughs> it's like a, it's, it, it's like a free geo site. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a relic of the past. But all right. So so now that we've got that out of the way, uh, I'm going to ask you to define some terms because you have worn many hats and we're going to be throwing a lot uh, around a lot of Hollywood terms that people might not be familiar with. So if you could, uh, in, in a general sense, can you define what an animation director is? I know you I don't know that you've directed animation, but if you could define that. Well, um, you have to def- you have to uh, uh, talk about where where you're oper- you know, in what system you're operating in. If you're in if you're working at Disney, if you're working at Netflix animation, if you're working at Nickelodeon, an animation director tends to, a, a director in animation tends to supervise all of the storyboard artists who draw the storyboards for the show and kind of dictates how the show is blocked, how it's drawn, which backgrounds they use, how the scenes are laid out. He's directing the scenes. Um, and by directing the scenes, he's telling the storyboard artist what to do, and all, and I'm doing a, a ton of storyboarding, his him or herself also. So that's what a director in animation, uh, and, and I've worked mostly in TV animation, less so in in feature animation, where it's a little different. But in TV animation, that's what a, a, a director does. At Adult Swim, things are different, mm-hmm. real different. So. Um, <laughs> How do I start? Um, like the first original show for Adult Swim was Space Goes Coast to Coast. And it's a late night talk show. And what we did was recycle all this animation from the original 60s Space Goes cartoon and put that character behind a desk talking to a blank monitor. And then we would put the guest in the monitor, the live action guest in the monitor. And that was just recycling this library of animations to match the new script. And that's kind of the production process for Aqua Teen and Squidbillies and kind of C Lab 2021, uh, a, a little bit the Brack Show, where you had libraries of character animations and libraries of backgrounds, and you just recycled them. So, like, there would be new animation for a show, but it would be like a character, the guest character, and there would be a new background. It's like one, maybe one new background per show. Um, or a couple of props because our budgets were so were so tight and it's a it's an adult comedy it's not action based it's kind of more dialogue based it's three characters standing around talking for 12 minutes for most of the time so uh in the aqua teen and squidbilly scenario you have the writers who also direct the show and direct all the voiceover and they just oversee everything about the show and the people under them are the editors who use these libraries to essentially lay out a rough cut of the show. And once that rough cut is approved, which may take six weeks or 10 weeks, that's handed over to After Effects and artists and animators who who essentially assemble the show at a higher resolution and add the lip flap to the blueprint that the editors have given them. So there's no like director in between in this scenario. So if you had to like make a one-to-one comparison, you know, Dave and Matt in Aqua Team, uh, I tell the story all the time, would famously like hand me a script and be like, the voiceover is on the server. I hope there's a show there. Good luck. I'll talk to you in two weeks. <laughs> and I'd cut dialogue for a week or two. Um, and there'd be a lot of improv. The scripts were great. I'm not taking anything away from Dave and Matt's writing of the scripts because they're great. But yeah, there'd be a lot of improv and a lot of like, I think there's a joke here. I think this joke goes this way. Here's a bunch of chaos. Put something together. And so that's what me and Ned Hastings and the other editors would do. And then we'd go through the radio play, as we call it. And then once that got approved and cut down to time, then we'd start laying in video. And and essentially the first pass of video was the editor's pass. And that's essentially what a director would do in regular animated terms is do the first pass, then hand it to the executive producers, the showrunners, and then they'd give their notes. 
So we were kind of the director in the scenario, but I wouldn't give us that title because we're really just editors doing our job. Right, right. So yeah, that that's really uh, what I wanted to cover there. You kind of touched on like the few different roles that you guys had, just so so the listeners would kind of know what we're talking about as we get into things. So you started out, uh, my understanding is you went to, uh, I believe Turner would be the correct word. You went to work for Turner because they were the only ones doing original kind of productions in Atlanta at the time. And you ended up on Space Ghost that way because of that. And were you familiar with Space Ghost beforehand? Were you a fan of the show? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I watched Space Ghost, the original, as a kid. And I distinctly remember... um, like it was kind of like a loss of innocence moment. I was watching Space Ghost after school, uh, and I realized that every episode was exactly the same, <laughs> and I never watched it again. You know, it was Hanna Barbera. Of course, it was always the same. It was just like three poses. So um, yeah, I definitely knew Space Ghost as, as as a character as a kid. And then when Space Ghost Coast to Coast started up, I knew. The editor working on it, Michael Cahill, who does, who's still at Adult Swim, who's still doing Bumps, I believe. Anyway, he ended the first like 14 episodes of Space Ghost. Um, and that was kind of like in the while I was transitioning from working at a post house as an assistant to working full time at Turner, where I was a full time editor and cutting promos and packaging for TBS, TNT, Turner Classic Movies, and a lot of times Cartoon Network. Um, so yeah, my first, uh, opportunity to work on space ghost was like episode 17 and I thought I was getting in late. Right. You know, I, thought, yeah. <laughs> you know, I didn't realize it would go on to be like a hundred episodes. Um, and my, yeah, my first episode was the, the guest was carrot top. Right, right, right. Yeah. And this was like 1997 or mm-hmm. something. So obviously I know you could probably go on, uh, I'm going to ask you our, our next question here. You could go on about this for a while, but in general, how did working on space ghost differ from aqua teen? Space Ghost was, you know, it's an interview show, so it was a lot more about making the, like the 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 interview, making jokes out of this just banter between the the three char- the three anime characters and the guest, a guest or two. Um, so the process of that show was uh, interview the celebrity or B celebrity or C celebrity or Susan Powder, the late night <laughs> talk, late night advertisement woman. Um, you know, we did get the Ramones. We did get some cool guests. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interview them with someone pretending to be Space Ghost. And whoever's like in the studio would be like, look left for Zorak and look in the camera for Moltar. And then and then Dave and Matt and a bunch of other writers, uh, Pete Smith, Barry Mills, um, sometimes Khaki Jones, Andy Merrill. They would write, rewrite the questions, essentially, and write a script changing up, changing up the questions for comedic purposes. And then... You know, after a couple of years, they got bored of just rewriting the questions. And they started to write more and more like story kind of things. So that's how Space Ghost go. The other variable of Space Ghost is George Lowe, <laughs> the voice of Space Ghost, mm-hmm. um, because he's a really great voice and he comes from radio. Mm-hmm. So if you listen to any radio in the Southeast, you heard him saying the call letters in, these, in those drop-ins. Like he did that for 100 radio stations potentially i don't know how many but he did a lot of that so he was a very announcerly voice which is what space ghost original voice was gary owens was an announcer um so i i wouldn't say that he was like a trained actor right i'm trying to be as diplomatic as possible yeah i understand <laughs> um but he's a great guy and i love george lowe so i'm not I'm, i i i don't mean to, uh, to to diss him but he's not a trained actor so so often like the tone of the script would be missed in his delivery but he's also a crazy person, and he would rant <laughs> for for an hour sure. in, amidst this 12-page script. So part of my job on Space Ghost was to catalog all of George ranting anytime, especially the, the simple ones, yes, no, like all the exclamations, like just to catalog that. And then we would win the script, which was was written off of a transcript of the interview, when it didn't match up or didn't work. We'd try to make a new conversation out of these George ad libs and what we had from our interview, which is like a locked piece of thing we can't change. So Space Ghost was very like rewriting in the edit suite many times, a lot of times, a lot of late nights of just 
just trying things out and seeing what worked. Gotcha. Yeah, as opposed to Aqua Teen, where if you if you guys thought of a new line, you could run down the hall and record it and have it. But like you said, with these celebrity interviews, especially like you couldn't. That's all you had really was what they gave you, and that was it. like the locked in solid piece of thing that wouldn't change. We could change anything Space Ghost said. We could change anything the character said. We could even, you know. So Aqua Teen was more telling a story and blocking a story, storyboarding essentially in the edit. But again, the similarity and the difference is like Aqua Teen mostly takes place in the living room of the house. The reason you don't, we don't do over the shoulder shots of the Aqua Teens, like we tried this in, in the pilot. Like normally in a conversation, you you shoot one character over the shoulder and seeing the other character. But you couldn't really, it didn't really work in Aqua Teen. Plus we would have had to draw the two sidewalls and that was too much background creation. So when they talk, it's just the background pr- proscenium and the characters standing at kind of a 45 degree angle looking at each other. And that's how we decided the show was going to work. So something I find interesting is that, so I just, you know, described your first job at Turner, but uh, you had to, my understanding is leave Turner to go freelance to work on Aqua Teen once they started. And I'm really, really sincerely wondering what did Dave and Matt have to pitch to you to get you to leave your job to work on Aqua Teen? That's a really good question. My guess is that the monster of the week element enticed you because I know a little bit about your interest in that, but I'd, I'd love to hear why that is or what they said rather. When they were pitching me on on leaving my, my, my good job at Turner to go freelance to work on the pilot of Aqua Teen, which was only like a guaranteed like six months of work. Um, I, it turned into 14 years. Um, <laughs> as things do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> here's, here's, here's part of what happened. Plus I love those guys and it was a fun project to work on. And I just wanted to, you know, tell stories rather than edit promos for the rest of my life. Not that there's anything wrong with doing that. People love it. I like telling stories better. Um, when I gave them my day rate, they kind of like, I, I, I gave them an hourly rate and they turned it into a day rate, which was way more money than I was asking for. So I said, yes. That was like the capper. I was like, oh, for that, I, I, I can't say no. I hope I'm not digging up any dirt, but why did you have to go freelance to work on Aqua Team? But my understanding is that Ned was still an employee of Turner. Um, uh, no, I, I think, I think the, 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 the sequence of events was actually that I had, I had edited many episodes of Space Ghost by 2000. Like I had been working on it three, four years. So um, Cahill and I, I think Cahill kind of stepped away from it. Anyway, I was kind of like one of the lead editors on Space Ghost. Um, uh, and Ned had edited a few episodes, like five, five or six or 10 episodes, but I had edited like 30 by then. So I was a little more familiar with Dave and, Dave and Matt maybe. So Ned started working on the pilot early in 2000. And then about June of 2000, I came in and kind of took over for Ned. Um, And Ned went out and did other things. And then once we got a series run, they rehired Ned and we worked on the show together. But they kind of did six months with Ned on the pilot and then brought me in to do another five, six months on the pilot uh, to finish it out. There's a commentary on the Meat Zone episode, and, and you and Ned are both on that commentary. And you you guys kind of go into, like, uh, it's basically established that you were better at the more complicated episodes of Aqua Teen, and that uh, you were, like, the cleanup guy. And my question really is, how did you get assigned to which episode you worked on? And, did like, did you get to pick which episode you worked on? No, David Matt would just kind of hand them out. Um, I think it was a more visually complicated one. Those would come to me. If it was kind of more dialogue, bantery driven, those would go to Ned. Um, yeah, generally, but we would both work on everything, kind of. Yeah, if there was, if if, if one of us got in, a, in, in in a spot where the other one's skills were needed, we just hand it off. Sure, sure. In season two of Aqua Teen, you guys did way more episodes where it's just the characters kind of talking amongst themselves. Did you have a preference for the kind of episode you'd work on? Like, did you prefer to do kind of the monstery ones as opposed to just the slice of life episodes? I'm trying to think of my favorite episodes. I do like, um, I do like Moth Monster Man, <laughs> you know, where it's kind of like a casual villain. Right. Yeah. I, I, uh, I listening to your whole episode of the dressing. That is a really fun episode that has a lot going on. That seemed like it was fun. Yeah. And it has a nice, like, 
you're, you're right about, and I don't even know if this is conscious when they're writing it because they write so quickly and so intuitively. But the fact that Turkatron goes from clearly a crazy person <laughs> to, oh, wait, maybe he's cybernetic ghost inhabiting this turkey. Like he, he goes on this on this on this roller coaster of is he crazy? Is he really from the future? Oh no, he's just crazy. Oh no, he's really from the future. Like that guy kind of like shifting back and forth is just I don't know that they ever planned for that episode to go that way. That's just how they naturally tell their stories. Uh since we're talking about that episode. I did reach out to Barry Mills and in, in the podcast episode, he hadn't gotten back to me yet, but he did get back to me like the next day. Uh, ki- kind of similar between your name and Barry's name is that when I, when I look up his name, I find somebody who is like in the Aryan Brotherhood or something like that. Oh God! So I'm wondering, in your opinion, what's worse, having a name that can be mistaken for somebody that you don't want to be associated with or have a name like Matt Malero that most people can't spell <laughs> or pronounce? What do you think is worse? That's a, that's a toss up. That's a toss up. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it took me about, about three months of working with Matt full time to be able to uh, spell his name regularly. So moving on, you did men- mention uh, Moth Monster Man. And in that episode, the Aqua Teens are watching this show called Assistant Living Dracula that you uh, made. Did you make that for Aqua Teen or did you already have that in oh, your yeah. back pocket? Oh, OK. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. We we made that for Aqua Teen. OK. Like I I had... I had a Sony PD-150. That's like a DV camera that Sony made. It's the same camera that David Lynch used to shoot his DV movie in the early 2000s. It's got a great, it's got a good lens and it's got a great monitor on it. So when you're looking in the monitor, it looks really cinematic and then you get the DV footage and it's just you know, DV <laughs> footage. So, um, so yeah, like I shot all the Aqua Team behind the scenes on that camera um, I believe that's what we shot Assisted Living Dracula on. Sometimes they would they would tap into and use the Turner staff camera operator folks and their gear. But I think for Assisted Living Dracula, we just shot that ourselves. I can't remember. I can't remember. There's also um, Vegetable Man. Right, sure. Yeah. And, and that with one. Don Kennedy. That one, like, I didn't ask about that one because we know that it was shot for uh, Aqua Teen because in the commentary, you guys mentioned that you shot it for Aqua Teen. So I kind of knew there. But yeah. yeah, both of those were shot for Aqua Teen to go on the TV. Yeah. I like Assisted Living Dr- Dracula. And Matt made the joke that we should actually call him Grandpire. <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh, my gosh. I don't know. Those, those are yeah. both good titles. I don't know which one I, w- I would have chosen. I know. Agreed. Agreed. This is kind of uh, in the in the weeds here, but actually in the rough cut of Rabot that's much longer, you also have an in-universe show that you made that doesn't make it to the final Rabot episode. But in that one, it, it's you. And in that commentary, you say your wife and a few other people you know who are in it. And then just a monster knocks on the door and they open it. Uh, was that made for Aqua oh. Teen or did you have that? No, no. Okay. No, no, that's that. Uh, I, uh, I, I did a series of short films in 99, 2000, 2001. Uh, which collected they're called the Monster Trilogy, um, and it's and it's kind of one of my favorite like vacation, like it's kind of like you 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 kind of turn a vacation into <laughs> into a job. But I like to take my friends to like uh, an Airbnb in the in the woods and then make a dumb movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so ninety nine two thousand two thousand one, I did that and I called it the Monster Trilogy. And I'd always like build a monster costume. And it would just be me and my friends running around. None of us are actors. And I would shoot it and I'd cut it in my, in my free time. Um, so, so those are called the Monster Trilogy. They're on YouTube. Yeah. And sometimes those clips from the Monster Trilogy um, will appear on the TV and Aqua Teen. But they also appear on the DVDs of a couple of Space Ghost episodes. Oh. Because a couple of Space Ghost episodes would have footage in the monitor that was in the Turner library, as in the master tapes were sitting there, but we didn't actually have license to use it. So like ultra seven and uh, Ultraman kind of shows, Moltar would watch a lot of that stuff and we just throw it in because we didn't even think twice about Turner owns it. We can use it. Sure. Um, But that's not really how licensing, (laughs) it's not really how ownership of of properties works. Yeah. So there's a couple of episodes of space ghost where instead of that, Turner library footage we replaced it with my with my dumb 
monster movies. <laughs> gotcha. Before I move on from that, I do want to mention that in the uh, the episode Universal Remonster, uh, they start watching a bowling show with puppets. And there's a lot of puppet in universe shows. Oh, and yeah. I know you worked on those because I've seen like the uh, behind the scenes pictures and stuff that are on the DVDs. And I, I just want to let you know that in, in the uh, Universal Remonster episode, I really dug into that bowling alley. That bowling alley, it closed during COVID and it never reopened, unfortunately. So it's kind oh, of... Oh, yeah. It was on Buford Highway, I believe. Sure, sure. Yeah. 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 It, it, it was really fun digging into this random bowling alley, like who owned it and everything like that. But yeah, there's a scene with the puppets in bed. Mm hmm. That make it into an episode? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my bed. That was oh, my was it bed. Really? Yeah, that's oh, wow. my bed. My yeah, when I was married, that was uh, that was that was my bed. Yeah, that was shot in my house. There's a really funny picture of you on the DVD where you have one of the naked puppets like hanging out of your mouth. You're you're biting her by like I, I can't remember where, but she's just like hanging out. It's very silly. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Like I can't thank you enough for talking about the DVD extras because I worked so hard on them oh it I shows can't tell yeah. you yeah and we'll, we'll get and more i into don't those i too. never yeah please okay we we, we 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 can put a pin in that but like like i put the dvds comes out and like like people don't talk about the extras that much well you know and let's like, talk about it now. i think they're really i think they're really interesting i think we did some good shit there i'd like to get uh i don't know if you've seen but the uh 20 disc oh. all the episodes just came out on dvd so they re-released them all so a lot of people are seeing these probably for the first time and I, and I kind of want to get your thoughts. I, I know that there's no new features on it, which is a huge disappointment. I really wish that... So there's no special features from the original DVDs? No, on? from the original there is, but there's no... Like, uh, for, for the first time, they're putting the final three seasons on DVD, and there's no new oh, special right. features for any of those. And No. Yeah. It's a, it's a, I was hoping that there would be something new there from, from you guys, but there's not. Oh, no. They're not going to spend... They're not going to give us any money for that. Yeah, there was, there was like a, a really golden era of TV on DVD between like... 2004 and 2010 where the budgets were pretty good they would give me the budget and i would shoot and produce all these dvd extras and i would produce it so whatever i didn't spend was my fee so so yeah that's what like producing dvd extras and working on aqua teen full time is what financed my first feature film oh and we'll, we'll get into that as well that uh sure. that's feature film but um i'm wondering uh this is Maybe an inappropriate question, but when something like this new box set comes out, do you receive like more royalties for this or no? Oh fuck no! Uh, that's what I expected, but I just wanted to ask. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. I, like I was, I was a producer in 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 activities and name, but not a producer in that I owned any part of the show. Gotcha. Okay. Like I got a producer credit, but I was really kind of like editing and post supervising is more accurate of a title. Because I kind of created the system that Aqua Teen was produced in. Gotcha. Okay. With the pilot and with, uh, and with the, the the first couple seasons, and then we just stuck with that process the whole time. Um, so yeah, uh, even even David Matt, um, who were employees for the almost the whole run of Aqua Teen, yeah, no, none of us get get royalties because we were because because David Matt the writers were employees. Even the actors were on buyouts instead of union voiceover deals. So they would get a fee and that would be the buyout for the whole entire history of the sure. the entire future of the thing. Mm -hmm. On to the DVD special features. The first two seasons have a lot of commentary tracks on them. Were you responsible for putting those together? Yeah, I think David Matt wanted to do commentary. So we would do, yeah, like four, like four or five episodes on the first two DVDs, right? Each, yeah, yeah. And then and then yeah, the, the yeah. whole uh, Volume 4 DVD was, it seems like you guys were at some event and you were all kind of like recording your own audio and you kind of throw it over oh, that, which is pretty interesting. Oh, it's, it's a nightmare. That I'm surprised anyone could listen to that. That was <laughs> that that was at my house, which which at the time in Atlanta was a loft. So it was like a giant concrete box. Yeah, it sounded like you're in an auditorium or something like that. Yeah, yeah. The like like the absolute worst possible recording location. But yeah, we we threw a party and I tried to play episodes without sound. So people <laughs> would watch them and comment yeah, on them. Yeah, yeah. And people would just stand around and drink and eat snacks and and um, and and record commentary that way. I think it's moderately successful at best. But yeah, thank you for listening to all that. It's better than nothing, though. I mean, I actually thought it was kind of cool. It's almost like you guys put put a uh, a podcast over the 
the second audio track and you can just sit there and listen to them all. I think it's really interesting. Yeah. 10 years before podcasts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, when picking like the commentary tracks, like how did you guys go about picking which episodes to do commentary for? And also how did you go about picking who would be in the commentary tracks? Oh, I think David Matt just picked David Matt and I would talk about which, which episodes to do commentary on um, mostly their choice. Um, and whoever was uh, nearby, we all like the entire crew was in Atlanta. Carrie Means lived in Atlanta. We would fly in Dana Snyder uh, for the DVD and put him up and uh, and drink a lot with him, uh, <laughs> and then do commentary and maybe shoot some behind the scenes stuff. Yeah. One of the uh, I think glowing achievements of your special features work are the Terraphone episodes. And genuinely, I think Terraphone is some of the funniest stuff you guys have done. Like, I couldn't believe just how great those were as just these random special features on a DVD nobody's probably going to watch. So I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about Terror Phone and what went into those three episodes. Oh, yeah. I'm really proud of Terror Phone. Did you watch the all three of them back to yeah. back to back? Yeah. 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 Um, I'm really proud of the Terror Phone short films. We, Dave and Matt always wanted to do more than just Aqua Teen. Matt was also writing like horror feature scripts the whole time he was working on Aqua Teen. Like Dave was always like doing other things. Um, so they really wanted to do more like, like none of us were animation people. Like we didn't grow up dreaming of working in animation. It was just that Cartoon Network was in the town we were in. Um, and that's the only place doing original programming. Um, so we kind of like ended up in animation, but we wanted to do other things, which is way sexier that, you know, making movies is way sexier than making an animated TV show. Like no one's going to debate that. So we would take the budget for the DVD and go to the Turner Home Enterprises, you know, corporate folks and be like, this is what we're going to do for the DVD. And the DVDs were making so much money. They're like, yeah, do whatever you want. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we would just take the budget for the DVD and make a short film starring all of us that worked in the film. We'd bring Dana in. Now, the first Terraphone is a miracle of production. Really? And like I talk about this all the time. And Dave and Matt are like, yeah, okay. But I'm like, no, this is a miracle of production. <laughs> so we were planning on shooting some kind of like behind the scenes tour of William Street. And me and one of the other PAs were like writing the script for it. And Dave and Matt, like on Friday. So we had Dana coming to Atlanta on Thursday, staying the weekend. So we were going to shoot this Thursday and Friday. On Friday, Dave and Matt were like, eh. We don't love that concept or that script. We're going to write something over the weekend. So I got the script for Terraphone 1 on Monday, and we shot it on Thursday. Wow. wow. So I found a location, a special effects person, a crew to shoot it in two days. So I produced, I produced and edited all the Terraphone movies. Okay. And I'm really, really proud of them. I think they're really funny. Mm -hmm. I think the end credit songs are so indulgent and obnoxious they're funny the songs are funny like i come to it from a like like i'm a I, like i make short films and go to film festivals and to have long credits on a short film is the most obnoxious thing you could do in the <laughs> middle of a, like a film festival screening granted these were mostly just seen on dvds but yeah i think the terraphone shorts are really really um really good Watching those, I just felt kind of a, a wave of maybe like morose or lament that you guys never got to go into live action. For example, I'm, something you said reminded me of Tim and Eric because they started on Adult Swim with animation and they weren't really animation guys either, but they got to make live action. And I, I was watching Terraphone like I, I would love to see you guys just make a sketch show or something like that. It would have been incredible. And I was just so sad that you never got to do that. Dave, well, uh, Dave paired up with uh, Chris Kelly for um, Your Pretty Faces Going yeah, to Hell. Yeah, true, yeah. And, like, I get, I, I, I've edited off and on every season of that. Yeah, great show. Great show as well. Thank you. Thank you. I, th I, I think it's a great show as well. So, yeah, that, that was kind of Dave's Dave's entrance into live action. Matt's done a lot of um, feature scripts work um, on a lot of stuff that, that never got made and not because Matt's scripts weren't great. Right. So, yeah, I understand. So, yeah. yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff out there that 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 that, uh, that gets overshadowed by Aqua Team. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. Before we move on from our special features, I just really want to give a sincere thank you to you because 
whenever I'm listening to a commentary and I hear you announce yourself, I'm like, all right, it's going to be a good commentary because Jay's going to ask actual questions that I can use for the podcast because I love Matt and Dave, but when it's just them on a commentary, they're just playing guitar for three minutes and fucking around. And that's fun, but it's like, all right, I can't use any of this for the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. They're fucking around. They're telling jokes. Like, I don't want it to be dry and informational only. Right. But sure. I want it to like, like not just be Dave and Matt being self-indulgently <laughs> sure, you know, sure. noodling. So, Something that you said in a previous podcast really piqued my interest, and I kind of want to steal that information for my podcast, and that is, uh, did you notice, and I know you have, a difference between Dave and Matt's styles, because you've worked so closely with both of them? For sure. For sure. Like, like and this is not a one-to-one, like, exact, like, demarcation between their styles, um, but uh, Matt is a little more the chaotic nonsense not nonsense but the 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 chaos of aqua teen is comes from matt all the heavy metal stuff comes from matt um dave's a little more structure a little more set up payoff joke um uh, dave was a little more involved like in the in the uh production of shows matt was a little more like write it and then let everyone do their job um so dave was a little more in like oh for this joke to work you got to edit it this way you got to kind of so Dave was a little more hands-on in the editing and, and, and like construction of the show. Aqua Team was like 10, year, 10 years of school on how to construct a joke, you know, how to tell a joke because I'm storyboarding and cutting dialogue and doing everything. And sometimes I'd miss, I'd just whiff on a joke and Dave would be the one that would, Dave would, you know, Matt, Matt also, but more often Dave would come in like, oh, it needs to ride this kind of wave or it needs to like, the close up goes here and that's where the payoff is because you know you're editing you're so inside something you, you, you kind of lose perspective sure sometimes. of course of course um so you know it's hard to say it's hard to say there is a a, a special feature of dave and matt writing yeah yeah which is like 30 minutes or four how long is that 45 minutes of them just it, it's long yeah it's around half an hour or longer yeah yeah like but that's like that's just real time of them writing a script and they would miraculously write a script in an afternoon and it would get recorded. They'd write a script on a Tuesday. It would get recorded on Wednesday and I'd start editing on Thursday. That's also like, like the miracle of adult swim, which is hire creators and let them go with no supervision because we can't afford to hire anyone else to supervise. <laughs> right. <laughs> Almost. Yeah. As, as a kid, I remember watching that, uh, that special feature that you just mentioned with them writing. And I was like, Oh, this is going to be so because I was 10 years old. I didn't know any better. I'm like, this will be so awesome to watch. And I just sat there as a kid like this is boring. Like they're just sitting there at a computer <laughs> writing out a, a script like it wasn't the, the sexiest thing. But it is cool now to go back and watch because you can literally see how the show came to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. They they uh, Nick and Katana Watt, who's who's all over the credits mm -hmm. of Aqua Teen for, for decades. Mm -hmm. I think he was a PA at the time and we just sent him with a video camera. To sit sit there, set it up, and hit and hit. Record. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I, I I don't know that I knew that he filmed that, so that's cool. Yeah, I, I believe he did. If you don't have an answer to this, I understand. But what is the most obscure Aqua Teen Hunger Force fact that you can think of that you don't know has been discussed? Um, I talk about the sound effects in Aqua Teen a lot. Um, like my joke is that if you have any questions about the existing fart sound effects library, I have the answers. <laughs> um. Not that there were that many fart jokes in Aqua Team, but right, um, but it's, yeah. it's a good joke. Mm. It's a good line. Um, there's um, there's a whoosh that is in the Frylock when Frylock shoots lasers. There's a whoosh sound effect that's always used in in golf commercials for the golf swing. Uh. <laughs> so it's like the same whoosh sound effect. Wow! And I hear that both places, so that's funny. Um, You've talked. I, I saw on the on the uh, your last podcast you identified the fire that gets recycled. Sure, sure. From, yeah. from the the Hanson Space Ghost mm -hmm. episode. I mean, we use that for a decade. Every time I see it, I point it out. Like it's like a running joke in the podcast. So I have to assume my listeners are like, "Yeah, we get it. It's this fire effect. Who cares?" But I, I love pointing it out every single time. That yeah, this is that fire. <laughs> Yeah, no, I love it. I love that we were so cheap that that was what we that was what we used. We had one collection of like twelve explosions 
that we bought from like a special, it was like a DVD. It was like a, a CD ROM of explosions that had beauties and mats. A mat is a black and white version of the explosion. So you can composite it over something. So that was the technology at the time. Um, and so we wanted to buy this and it was like $200 or something. And we had to split it with C-Lab, <laughs> you know, because sure. it was like outside of our regular production cost. There's so, there's also some explosions that we use in Aqua Teen that we had beauties and mats for that we got off a tape that was created for WCW Raw. Oh, wow. Whatever the wrestling show was on TNT in the late 90s, we got a hold of one of their explosion Wow. Explosions. So some of the explosions are from wrestling. Oh, I used to watch that as a kid too. So that's kind of crazy that there's a connect. I never would have expected. It would be hard to identify. Yeah. Yeah. Because those were shot for like going in front of characters, walking in front of them to go along a walkway or something. So we would just use a, a corner, a portion of them. But yeah, so there was that. Um, what else? Oh, if, um, I, if I could ask, because you're talking about the sound effects. Sure. At the beginning of every Aqua Teen episode, there's usually like a little sound effect that will be played later. Uh, I I assume you know what I'm talking about, right? There's yeah. always like, okay, yeah. so so there's how like would... a little moment. There's there's an extra beat at the end of the song where yes. there's a sound effect yes. drops in. That was all in the mix, in the sound mix. So that was all after production ended. Like I was never, I would never put that in in my edit. That was always done by okay. by the sound mixer. Okay. I, yeah, I always kind of wondered that. All right. Well, uh, I have a question for you because I am currently covering season two, as you know, since I just covered the dressing. What was it like making 24 episodes? That's the most, like the biggest order you guys ever had. It was crazy. Yeah, we had, I can't remember who else was working other than me and Ned, but we had other editors. Yeah, like John Breston, I think, pops up. Yeah, yeah. John Breston came in um, from PA into editing. Um, um, yeah, it was crazy to do that many episodes. We could have done that many episodes every year. Like it doesn't, it's not a giant crew to do Aqua Team, um, but they just wanted like 13 and then 10 per year after that, which was not enough, honestly, to keep everyone busy, but everyone was employed full time. So it was kind of easy, not easy, but you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. 10 episodes of a 12 minute show is not, is not a full season's worth of production, but we, we would, that's what we would do. Well, I have, to, I have to ask then, um, you guys did go on to only make 10 episodes a season. And I understand like Matt and Dave went off to make other shows. I guess I, I'm kind of answering my question, but like, what would the rest of the crew go and do? Would you guys just like, I, just, I, I know you, you went on to work on some of those other shows. It just always like made me wonder like what everyone else did after you guys dropped down to 10 episodes a season. So Ned and I had offices next to each other and we're both kind of music nerds. And in the era, of after Napster got shut down, there was a really beautiful era of music blogs where people would take old obscure records and rip them to digital and then post those songs and all the artwork of those albums on their blogs. And Ned and I would spend hours going through all of our favorite record blogs, downloading obscure 60s garage rock compilations. I mean, hundreds of them. That's what we would do with our time. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> we would also produce shows and stay on schedule. Yeah, of course. You got to get some work done. But we would spend a lot of time doing that. In season two of Aqua Teen, we finally see characters start to drink beer, like on screen. Obviously, we see beer cans in the first season. Were you given the okay to show these things? Or did you just keep trying to do it until they let you do it? I think it's the second one. I don't remember there being, there was probably discussions of that. And there was like a long time of trying to get standards and practice to understand that we weren't being held to what's called kid vid laws because we were after 10 PM, we were TV 14 or TV, whatever we we're rated differently. Like we didn't have to stick to the cartoon network children's standards. We were doing something different and it took a long time to convince to like, we had to argue for every little thing we did. Um, you know, anytime there was a, a fluid that came out of an alien's body, that fluid could not be brown, it could not be yellow, and it could not be red because we couldn't show shit or piss or blood. So 
every alien was full of purple liquid. <laughs> well, there is a Dr. Weird skit where he he grafts a uh, a deer antler to his dick, basically. And Steve's like, well, how do you go to the bathroom? And then Dr. Weird just shoots a stream of blue liquid out of his mouth. And I'm like, is this supposed to be random or is it supposed to be pee? Like, what's going on here? And, and I kind of assumed it was pee. It had to be blue because no other color was was legal. OK, perfect. Yeah. What do you miss the most about working on Aqua Teen? Oh, I, 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 I really love the, 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 the let's just create it of, of it all. Um, like after moving to LA, I worked for, I did a couple years of Disney and I, I did all three seasons of uh, Kid Cosmic at Netflix, which are great shows and great experiences. And I love the people I work with, but you're very kind of segmented. Like I'm cutting storyboards and then handing it off to the animators. And sometimes I'm involved in the conform of the animation that comes back from overseas or wherever it's being animated. Um, but it's very segment, segmented. With, with Aqua Teen and with Adult Swim, like it's just me and David, Matt, and Ned in a room creating the show. Like I'm doing all the work, which is sometimes a very heavy lift to put in every background to storyboard a show essentially from backgrounds and character animations. Um, but like we're creating the whole show, you know, I also like ran post. I was also like the post supervisor. So like I made sure the, 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 the computers ran and the storage ran and I made sure, you know, I mastered, I mastered the first three seasons of Aqua Teen on tape. Like, you know, like the master, I created the master tapes for the first three seasons of episodes. Like it was just, it was just us. It's not like, like, you know, like operating in, uh, in, in, in the Netflix animation world, which is already different from when I, when I did it. But, you know, there was like, when I, when I would conform all the animation from overseas, my final output would be an edit decision list or an XML. If you're, if you're an editor, you know what I'm talking about. It's a file that says which shot goes in what order on the master tape. And I hand that off to a company and they do the conform and the processing and the deliverables. So like, that's a whole company that just does that. Whereas in Aqua Teen, it was me and Final Cut Pro and a DigiBeta tape machine and a stereo mix. So, you know, that, that kind of hands-on, we're creating this ourselves and there's also like there's no creative oversight at adult swim there's no one like giving you creative notes because there's just not that many people and lazo just lets people run once he's on to focusing on something else so no one like other than standards and practice and legal there was no creative oversight that would see the show until it aired like sometimes lazo wouldn't see episodes he wouldn't see a script he wouldn't see a rough cut no one would <laughs> see it until it aired so we had total like creative freedom to do whatever we could get past we could you know we could get within standards of practices and legal so yeah it was it was quite the quite the creative uh, environment so uh, i want to uh, preface this question with not for any monetary or resume building reason were there any other adult swim shows that you wished you got to work on but hadn't after a cut, like when Squidbillies, when the Squidbilly pilot was in production, I was begging to edit the Squidbilly pilot because I had been on Aqua Teen for like four or five years um, and was desperate to do something different. And I edited four Squidbilly pilots that were all bad. They're all in the Squidbilly DVD. Some of them are just radio shows. Some of them got storyboards. They're all terrible. <laughs> That's and, what I hear. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. They're just crazy. They're just like too crazy. Like every line was trying to be a punchline. And that came from kind of the top down as far as the direction of where the show wanted to go. And then once it was dead and executives, the executive kind of focused on something else, Dave Willis and Jim Fortier, who ran the entire run of, of Squidbillies, got to kind of reformat it and rethink about it in their own way because they're from where the show is set. And they cast like their high school buddy to do the voice of Rusty. Was it Rusty? Yeah, 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 it was. Yeah, I remember I hear I heard Dave talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. There's also a name in the pilot that's different. So Oh, okay. 
yeah, so I worked on the Squidbillies pilot for like six months and was like, get me out of this. This is, <laughs> let me go back to Aqua Team, <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, I, 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 I worked a little bit on the Brack show. I worked a little bit on uh, uh, C-Lab occasionally, um, just like helping them out once in a while. Like everything that came through William Street, I would I would touch a little bit if they needed it. Um, but no, I was happy with just doing Aqua Team. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. For me as a fan of the show, that's awesome to hear that you just loved that show so much. It wasn't like, you know, just a job to you guys. I think that shows in the work that it wasn't just a job that you really, really liked what you were doing. Right. And I had my creative outlets external to that. I made my my short films, the Silly Monster Trilogy. I, did, I directed a documentary in 2002, 2003, a documentary short film. And then I wrote Stomp Shout Scream and produced Stomp Shout Scream while working full time. Like I produced, I, I, I wrote, directed and produced and edited an indie feature film while like, well, never really taking time off from my full-time job at Aqua Team. Right, right. So I had my outlet. If you could go back to 2000 and give a young J. Wade Edwards advice on editing Aqua Teen and working on Aqua Teen <laughs> with the knowledge you have now, what would you tell that young man? Yeah, um, this, is, this, this is something that was probably intuitive at first, but then it wasn't until I was like training other editors that I kind of like voiced it to them and myself at the same time, which is do the first pass of everything as fast as you can. So when you build like the first pass of the show, it's the radio show. So it's just dialogue and a little sound effects. Um, to do that as quickly as you can. Don't belabor picking which take is perfect on that first pass. Just throw in the first take or the last take. It doesn't matter. Because you never know, you're never going to know what take is best until you hear what comes before and what comes after. And then you can eliminate what's wrong and then put in what's right. So when you're editing, just do it as fast as you can, especially when you're cutting dialogue. And then because you're going to go back and do it, do another pass and clean it up and do another pass and clean it up and do a third pass and clean it up. Um, it's much more efficient and you're, you're, you're not going to make yourself crazy. You're not going to burn yourself out trying to be perfect on the first pass because you're never going to be. You're always going to do another pass. So just do it fast first and then go back and, and, and evaluate it. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, just don't be precious about, you know, that first pass. Just get it done and, and right. move on. Yeah, because because when it's dialogue and Aqua Teen is all dialogue and it's all improv. That's why my podcast works is because of, of of that radio play element that you speak of. If it was an action show, my podcast just wouldn't work. So that's what I appreciate about the show. Because <laughs> I'd, I'd be playing clips of people grunting and, and punching each other. You know what I mean? That's like right. it, would, it just wouldn't work. That's right. That's right. It's 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 again a tribute to David Matt's writing. Obviously, you've worked on some Aqua Teen stuff recently. For example, uh, you cut a lot of the HBO max commercials that kind of are promos that were playing you worked on a few aquadong side pieces and you did have some involvement in plantasm the upcoming film but my question is if let's say hypothetically of course to any listeners i don't have any knowledge of this this is pure speculation if aqua teen was picked up for like let's say a season on hbo max would you want to go back and, and continue to work on it oh sure oh sure that'd be fun yeah, I, f I figured I, I knew the answer, but... <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. I don't know that I want to do it full-time. I'd, I'd rather... I, I, I like the life of a freelancer. Um, I like doing something different every six or nine months. Um, so yeah, if they need me to uh, pick up a couple episodes, I'd do it in a heartbeat, and, and I would be the... I'm, I'm like the best person to do it because I've done more Aqua Team than anyone else. Mm, exactly. You know? What advice would you give to anyone wanting to become an editor? Um, make a short film. Because by going through production, even if it's just the dumbest, simplest thing, and then cut it together yourself, you know, it doesn't matter if the audio is bad. It doesn't like it's going to be frustrating because the audio might be bad or, or the shots might be bad, but you're going to learn so much about the process. You can't do if no matter what you want to do in production, if you want to be a director of photography or a sound mixer or an editor or a director, you've got to know something about every other thing in the production process to be a good editor. You got to know something about lighting to know why something is fucked up or why something is wrong. So go experience the whole, the whole gamut of production so that if you really want to be an editor, you can understand everyone else's job and do your job even better. 
you did work on something called, I believe it's pronounced uh, Korenstein or, or uh, Kornstein or <laughs> Korn, something. Kornstein, like. yes. Kornstein, there yes. it is. Uh, where where you and a bunch of other directors and everything, you all kind of uh, shot your own little uh, short segments of the, uh, of a Frankenstein story and kind of put them all together, compiled them into one video. And my question is, are you aware that similar things are being done for Aqua Teen Hunger Force? No, I did not know that. Yeah, so there's currently uh, a video out called Brood Witch Reanimated, which is a bunch of different uh, animators, uh, obviously amateur animators, all coming together in, in their own style and, and reanimating segments of the Brood Witch episode. Then it's all compiled together with the original audio, but all this new animation. And then currently a uh, listener of the show, uh, Zeus is what she goes by. She's only like 16 or 17. She's currently putting together one for Rabot. Oh, and wow. I think that's almost done now. So I, I, of course, I will send that your way, the Rabot one when it's done. But yeah, it's just like, again, the show is kind of going through a renaissance because both of these videos are very recent where all these uh, animators who probably weren't even uh, out of diapers yet by the time that the show was actually airing, uh, they are coming together now and just reanimating. And there's all it's so cool to see all these different art styles and, and just tributes to the show. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention because it's kind of similar to what I saw you were doing with the uh, will, Frankenstein thing. Yeah, I will totally look 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 that up. Yeah, that yeah I'll send amazing. them to you. Yeah, I'll send them to you. Yeah, oh no, yeah, it's, it's insane. Me. Yeah, I'll send them to you. Yeah, it's insane, yeah, the production I would love values. That. That's, yeah. that's incredible. I, I, like, I can't believe people care that much, but that's that's killer. We're going to jump now into your other work outside of Aqua Team. But before that, I actually have a question for you from a giant Aqua Team fan, probably the biggest Aqua Team fan I know. This person is such a huge Aqua Team fan that he actually... He auditioned for the voice of Master Shake, and he got the role, and he's voiced Master Shake for the past 20-plus years. Uh, a young man by the name of uh, uh, Dana Snyder, I think is his name. <laughs> and his, his question for you is, uh, he wants to know what the story behind your hat that you're wearing is. That, that's what he, he wants to ask you. Um, this hat is by a company called The Clink Room. This is their logo. Um, and this particular hat is like a, it's like a, a Bigfoot fire yeah. tiki hat tiki, yeah yeah it kind of matches I, I i have enough like baseball hats that i kind of coordinate them with my hawaiian shirts or cowboy shirts um so yeah this is just a one-off from the clink room which i which i purchased like last year and showed up like two months ago oh oh wow so you you got really early was it like a pre-order or something or that's how they run their business is they they announce designs and you pay for that hat and that design, and then it goes in production. And because of the pandemic and supply chain, mm -hmm. right, this sure. or that, it mm -hmm. really literally took 15 months to get my hat after I ordered it. But it's a killer hat. Yeah, it's all. Yeah, it's very colorful. I'm actually. I'll ask you. I'll, I'll message you on Twitter if you could uh, kindly send me a picture of the hat, since obviously this yeah. is an audio only podcast, so people sure, won't no exactly know what it looks like. But yeah, I reached out to Dana and asked if he'd have a question for you. That's what he had, and then I reached out to Ned, and unfortunately, he saw the message but never responded. And I would like to think that he just had so many questions for you, <laughs> he couldn't pick one, and he's, he's currently crying himself. Okay, here's 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 the question that Ned would have asked is um, why have I not written the two sequels to Stomp, Shout, Scream that I've been talking about for That's actually my years? next question for you. <laughs> yeah, there was, um, yeah, uh, Stomp, Shout, Scream was the first of a, of a, of a Skunk Ape trilogy. Um, so anyway, yeah. And, and, and of course, Ned would be involved in all of them. Of course, yeah. So, so, so moving into that, that's a perfect segue here. I didn't even uh, imagine that that would happen. It seemed like you had the idea pretty early on, like like in the early 2000s, you started working on this. And then eventually, I know in 2004, you filmed it. And then the film came out in 2005. Because I say that because in the episode Super Trivia, I see Stomp, Shout, Scream as an answer to a question. So that came out in 2003. So I know you were obviously working on it then. But uh, yeah, it, 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 it's a very fun uh, kind of beach party slash uh, monster movie. It, it's just... It's all over the place, but in, like in the best way possible. Thank you. Of course, there's there's some uh, cameos in that. Well, not not even a cameo. We have Ned Hastings, editor on Aqua Teen, who shows up. He wears the uh, not only the outfit of the skunk ape, which is like a Bigfoot character in Florida, but also he, you know he he has a, a little cameo as himself with Dana Snyder in it. I guess my question for you, since you never got around to making more Stomp Shout Scream, is where is the skunk ape now? Because at the end of that film, uh, spoilers. He, he, he kind of uh, disappears. Where is That's he now, right. do you suspect? Well, the I believe I still have pieces of that 
uh, gorilla suit in my garage. Um, <laughs> I got a new gorilla suit for Christmas last year for my brother because I um, I was going to shoot some another um, uh, a Bigfoot uh, another Skunk Ape short film over Christmas, but it didn't quite work out. I haven't finished it. I've been busy working. Work is getting in the way of all my uh, creative uh, endeavors. So yeah, Stomp Shot Scream is a '60s beach party rock and roll movie, and then I had. Um, a sequel called Hoot Holler Howl, which <laughs> Hoot Holler Howl was five years later. And uh, uh, Theodora, who's the lead of Stomp Shot Scream, is, is now in a country western band in the Midwest. Oh, and, I love that. And of course she falls. It's the same movie. She falls in love and the skunk ape finds her and kills everyone <laughs> around her. And she has to escape the skunk ape again. And then in the third movie, I believe the idea was – was to she becomes an astronaut and is in space and the skunk ape follows her <laughs> to space. So I haven't written those movies, but that was those were the sequels that I've been talking about for fifteen years. Um, before we move on, I actually I don't own that film. I was wondering if you were still selling signed copies of it. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, uh, there there's an Etsy site. Just just Google Etsy for Stomp Shot Scream, and it's a combo of original DVD that I printed up 15 years ago and a, a, a soundtrack on CD. I'll also throw in a couple stickers. Cool. Yeah. Cause I was actually thinking I, I want one for myself. I was thinking of buying another one and, and doing like a giveaway for a fan to like to celebrate our interview, giving that film away. Buy so. one. I'll send you as many as you want. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I have a question here for you and I apologize if this came with the DVD because I don't have a DVD, but I did find this on eBay. It is a postcard, a stomp shout screen postcard. <laughs> Wait, I don't you know. bought the postcard on eBay? Yeah, I don't know. Did this come with the DVD or like, did I waste my money or is it like an actual like unique item here? Uh, I, I printed up a stack of those. I don't have any more of those postcards, I don't think. Oh, do you? I can send it to you if you want it. No, 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 no. You should keep it. Um, uh, I printed up a stack of those for the film festival run. So okay. when it was screening at a film festival, I'd print up stickers of when the screening day, day and time and location mm -hmm. was. And I'd put stickers on the back of the postcards and then hand them out at the film gotcha. festival kind of generated audience. Okay. Yeah. I just saw it on eBay. I was like, I didn't see anything about it anywhere else. So I was like, I'll pick, if it's, if it's obscure, I want to pick it up, but I was hoping it wasn't just like a DVD insert That's or crazy. something like that. I wonder who had that. I, it's in perfect condition. Like it's, there's no bends or anything in it. It's like brand new. I mean, new. I would leave stacks of them on, on film festival <laughs> tables. So. Obviously, you have an idea of where the skunk ape went. I'm not a, a Hollywood writer, but if, I, if you would entertain my suggestion, if you ever do get around to making more, I think if you wanted to get political, you could have where the uh, the governor of Florida sends the skunk ape to Martha's <laughs> Vineyard <laughs> it, it, to get rid of it. And then uh, those people have to take care of the skunk ape or something like that. I don't know. Just kind of just an idea I had while Brilliant. watching the film. Brilliant. <laughs> um, so since we're talking about that film, I, I would like to tell you my absolute favorite thing you've ever done outside of Aqua Teen is the blog that you have accompanying a stomp shout scream because oh I, the the long the long ignored blog i made the mistake of starting to read this before going to bed i was up for like an hour and I, I haven't read all of it if anybody is interested in going into filmmaking please read this blog i'll put a link to this in the show notes obviously because it's insane you're like yeah we're filming in a week and a lead actor dropped out we have to call somebody and and interview him on the, on the phone and hire him on the spike i just couldn't believe that the film ever got made but not only that but you have uh the, the, there's an entry from ned hastings about it and there's an entry from mary Kraft, who of course has done stuff uh within the aqua teen universe i was like what is like this is insane this blog it's so good i could i couldn't stop oh, reading it i had to force myself thank you thank you yeah no I, I i did i did a blog post like every week through the whole production of that film all the way through post. And like, thank you for noticing. Cause I don't think anyone. <laughs> like, it's so underrated. I'm like, he should print this out and like sell it as a book or something. Cause like, I just, I couldn't put it down. Like I had to force myself to turn off my phone and go to oh, bed because you. I was like, yeah, like you're, you're so open and honest in it about like the realities of, of uh, film production. And, and even with that, you're luckily uh, the producer on the film. Unfortunately, I don't know their name, but uh, you're like, yeah, they had to had to deal with a lot of the issues. So you're only getting like the biggest of issues. Right. Arma. Arma was my Arma, line Yes, yes. Yeah, because yeah, I, I don't know anything about filmmaking, really. So like it was just a huge insight into this whole process. It was oh, incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Um, Storm Show Screen is, is crazy because um, we originally wa we wanted to feel like a 60s beach party movie. So we were um, I, I, and again, like it was almost 
it was probably 75% paid for by, um, by me producing DVD extras uh, outside of my day job. So the film was produced uh, for about $160,000. The feature, $160,000 in 2005, 2004. Um, uh, and we miraculously, we were planning on shooting it on a 16 millimeter, but we got a 35 millimeter package camera package for the same price. We're like, we're going to shoot on 35, like, holy shit. What? So we actually, (laughs) we bought short ends of film, which is reels of film where they only shot like one minute out of the eight minutes that's on the reel of film. Um, and, uh, our short ends, uh, the stock that we wanted was available from uh, Walk the Line, the Johnny Cash bio picture. Oh. <laughs> so, no way. Yeah, so it's like a rock and roll lineage film. So like all the leftover film from, from Walk the Line was used to shoot Stomp Shout Scream. And I still have some of those short ends in my garage because I'm a bit of a pack rat. Oh, no way. I'll send you a picture. Yeah, I'd love that. Yeah, I'd really love that. Wow. So yes, uh, Stomp Shout I-, I had seen it in the past, but I- I've watched it... I think three times in the past couple of days. Just it, it's, it's such a fun world to like live in. Obviously, there's some murders and some gore, but outside of that, I just really like the music is great. If if you could uh, do me a favor here, so the music was composed by the band Cat Fight. Is that correct? That's correct. And if you would do me a favor and explain uh, the, the uh, connection between Cat Fight, the, the, who did the music for your film, and uh, the the uh, music in the 2007 Aqua Teen film, because we have Mastodon opening up that film, right. Right. Um, sure. Sure. So, you know, we're producing in Atlanta, like we're just using our resources around us. And Catfight is an Atlanta based all girl garage rock band. And I was writing uh, I, when I was kind of concepting the script. Um, I was like, I was going to I wanted to make some kind of beach party movie because I like I love those movies, but those movies are terrible. But I love them and they're <laughs> terrible. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I, I, I realized I had to make a monster movie because I just that's how I can structure a beach party movie is around a monster on the loose. And so I was trying to figure out what the story was, what the story was. And um, I was kind of like uh, a big fan of cat fights. And my wife at the time was in uh, graduate school at Emory with <laughs> with Jennifer Kraft. Uh, who sings and plays in cat fights. So they became friends because they'd talk immunology, bio, you know, stuff, science stuff. Yeah. Um, so I became uh, kind of like acquaintances, friends with, with, with Jennifer and the, and, and the women who, who performed in, in, in cat fight. And then they had a really amazing, funny song, um, which is a lonesome lament called syphilis. Um, and as I was watching all these old beach party movies, there's always a moment where Annette and Frankie fight and Annette walks the beach sad that she's in a fight with her boyfriend and sings a song. And I put syphilis in that moment and was like, (laughs) that's my movie. And so literally I was like, that moment will take place on page 75 in the structure of a normal script. And I literally wrote the entire script around that one <laughs> based on Catfight's song. Whether the movie is good or not, that's up to you. Watch the movie if you like. But that moment is, 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 uh, tickles me to this day. Well, I believe I heard you say in an interview that uh, one of the women from Catfight is married to the guy in Mastodon. The the drummer for Catfight uh, is married to the drummer in Mastodon. Yes, gotcha. that's correct. Oh, but I, I like to imagine they're both just at home on their drum kits, just like practicing right, together. Right. Um, I don't I don't know if they're still together. And I and 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 Catfight has played some shows this year, but uh, Suzanne, the drummer, has moved to Florida, I believe, or somewhere else. So I don't know that she's still performing with the bands. She's looking for Skunk Ape in Florida That's now. Right. Uh, That's right. But but I was wondering, did you have any influence on Mastodon being, obviously they're an Atlanta band as well. Did you have any influence on them getting into the 2007 film? That's all Matt. That's all Matt and Dave. Um, they, 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 Matt of course knew them because he's a, he's a metal guy. Um, and they were, they're like, like the drummer uh, for Mastodon is, is kind of a, a just a nerdy, funny personable guy he's not a heavy metal like like a a type or you know um aggressive personality at all um not that any of them are probably 
but he's such a sweet guy. He's such a sweetheart, such a funny, funny guy. And he's like, what kind of voice do you want? Do you want uh, a high pitched metal screaming or do you want mm-hmm. Grover? Cause those are the <laughs> only two metal voices that exist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's how they got involved. Gotcha. This, this actually reminds me of a question I, I forgot to ask. Uh, going into the 2007 Aqua Teen film, you obviously, since you did Stomp, Shout, Scream, you already had feature length film experience. And I, I, I know that uh, Matt and Dave had done like other work on stuff before Aqua Teen. But as far as I know, they never really led a full length feature like that. But you had. Did they ever defer to you in the whole process because you had that experience? Like I was kind of like the lead editor. Like my credit on that is like senior editor, lead editor or whatever. So I was kind of like lead editing everyone else's work on, on the Aqua Teen movie. And as you can see on the DVD, we did an entire movie and then rewrote, and then Dave and Matt rewrote about 45% of it. Yep. Um, yep. Yep. Um, so yeah, it was, it, it was two and a half years to get that produced. Um, and I was really involved in the editing and the, uh, the, the cutting of it. Um, uh, and kind of directing the other editors a little bit, uh, but then, like, how do we get this onto a film? How do we get this in theaters? Because in 2005, 2006, there was no DCP. There was no digital film projectors widespread in theaters. You still had to go to a film print. And I actually knew how to – I didn't know how to do that, but I knew the process of doing that because I had explored it with Stomp Shot Screen because we shot on film, finished in digital video, and never went back to film, but I knew the process of doing that. So I kind of like figured out how to get from a digital animated world into theaters on film prints. So Aqua Teen was screened on film when it was in theaters. Oh, like wow. they made, I think it was in, I can't remember how many theaters in. Was it 300 or 700 theaters? However many theaters was in, they made that many film prints to distribute opening weekend. Um, so me and Dave and Matt and Dana Snyder, we all got film prints. So Dana has a couple of film prints at his house. I have a film print that I keep at the UCLA archive. So if a theater wants to screen the Aqua Team movie, they just call it the UCLA archive oh, wow. and borrow it or rent it from them. And it's my print. So yeah, I was involved in that stuff. Yeah, because I mean, obviously, you worked on the on the film. I know that you like edited on it and everything, but I just didn't know if maybe they, it, you know, as being like one of the few guys who actually had your own feature film at that point, if, if maybe you uh, they came to you a little bit for your uh, input on on that side of things. They just told me to edit, but yes, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, I, I I certainly helped out in the in the in the nuts and bolts of getting it getting it into a a, a format. Like we had to reformat all the elements for the Aqua Team movie. Oh, of course. Yeah, because yeah. standard def would have never done it. So we had to re essentially rescan all the original paper animated stills mm-hmm. uh, and then up them to HD. So sure. the Aqua Team movie was up all the elements, all the backgrounds, all the characters mm-hmm. to HD. And then from then on, all the episodes were in HD as well. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for, for this podcast, this podcast is listener supported and I have a Patreon. So people who support the podcast they uh, get my exclusive coverage into the 2007 film. I put out like a little episode at the, end, at the end of every month. So I've been going through comparing the original deleted film to like the film that actually came out. And and it, it's almost jarring because most of the of the month I'm, I'm focusing on the 2003 season. And then I jump over to this 2007 film where everything is like upscale and everything looks beautiful. And I'm like, oh my God, what's going on here? Everything isn't pixelated. And so it, it, it's, it's always fun to uh, jump between those two. Um, yeah. But back to your other work outside of Aqua Teen, you film on, on your iPhone. You've been making some iPhone films now. And, and I like this because it carries on the spirit of Aqua Teen Hunger Force and Space Ghost, where it's like, just do the thing. Don't focus so like make it as good as you can. It doesn't have to be per- not to say that your uh, iPhone work isn't perfect, but like you're, you're not being, you know, you're just like, well, I got this thing in my pocket. I'll go make a movie with it. Your your film that's out now, like I think the uh, probably the most notable one is the Condemned, which uh, I was hoping you could uh, tell the audience a little bit about that. Sure, it's it's like an extension of the the monster trilogy that I did in my late twenties. It's twenty years later, and I'm still I'm still taking my friends on vacation and shooting and making them shoot a <laughs> film while they're on vacation. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Condemned uh, was a script that I wrote with a, a screenwriter friend of mine here in LA, a TV writer. Um. 
and it's about a, a woman who's who's condemned to be hanged, and all of her enemies show up in this little town, this little old west town, uh, to see her hanged, and they are slowly being murdered one by one. And so you don't, you know, the whole the short film is like who's who's in who's working in cahoots with the condemned or what's happening. So it's really fun. We really wanted to be very um, 60s Italian spaghetti Western style. Uh, so I got an original score that's very spaghetti Western, very Ennio Morricone um, early on. And, and again, this is, this is me and my friends who either work in production or don't, but it's just non-actors right, right. playing Western. And we found this amazing uh, Airbnb in Joshua Tree, California, that has an old west town on the property and a train car and a chapel and sleeps seven, sleeps eight people. So we rented that for the weekend, shot it in two and a half days, um, uh, and would just like cook big meals and then put on costumes and run around the desert. Super fun, super fun. So, yeah, I think that turned out really well. Like, as I was editing the film, I realized that we're going to need to do some ADR, which is automatic dialogue replacement, um, which is anything but automatic. It's when you have to revoice, <laughs> re- revoice and match the lips of, of your characters. And I knew my non, my friends, non professional actors would not be perfect at that. So that's when I decided to dub the whole thing into Italian. No. So I hired a dubbing company to dub it into Italian. So that's, and so the master of that film is in Italian with English subtitles. So that's pretty funny. It kind of adds the, to the, the plan. So the plan was not to make it in Italian then. Oh no, we shot it in English. Right. Yeah. It's just that yeah. some of the, some of the, some of the uh, dialogue is, is not usable. So I just dubbed the whole thing in Italian. Obviously. Yeah. The, the mouths don't match up with the Italian overdub, but I assume that was your intention the entire time. I didn't know that this, right. this was kind of like a result of just something you had to do. Right. And again, I didn't hire like eight different Italian actors. I just hired a dubbing company who just does this, who just does this for a living. And so like they did a really good job on the first one. I hired them. Like I've shot a second. There's it's a Western trilogy. And again, like the first one is the condemned. The second one is the captain, which is teased at the first one. So the captain, the second in the trilogy has been shot and mostly edited. Um, uh, it's about pirates who are stuck in the desert and they fight with cowboys. It's like cavalry versus pirates. So they have sword fights and stuff. Well, well there's a legend behind this, correct? Yes. Yes. The Salton Sea, which is a salted lake in Southern California, well, at one point was connected to the Bay of California, which is the bay between Baja, California, and Mexico, and the desert in California. So the legend has it that during giant storms, the Bay of California and the Salton Sea would connect, and ships would sail up. And when the storm would end, the, the, water, the, the water level would go down, and then the ships were now stuck in this lake. So there is a legend of, and it's all mud, so... Anything that gets near the lake sinks into the mud and then pops up later randomly. So there's legends of Spanish pirate galleons in the Salton Sea that pop up and then disappear. And this has been like an Old West legend from the 1850s. And there's so many accounts of it. I've done lots of research of crazy people talking about this. <laughs> so that's what my that's what my the second of the Western trilogy is about. This clan of pirates that has been stuck in the desert waiting for the rains to come for uh, for five generations. And now it's, an, or three or five, you know, because that would be like 1850s to 1750s. So whatever it was. Anyway, it's a stretch. Um, but anyway, that's what the second one's about. Uh, I just, like, I'm trying to get a couple of pieces of music composed. And, like, I've contacted a couple of my music friends and, you know, it hasn't been it hasn't been completed yet. But, it's 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 in uh, the works though. It's yeah. I mean, it's been shot. It's been shot, which seems like the, the biggest. It's been uh, shot. Part. It, it was shot like almost th- two and a half years ago. Now it'll be three years this Thanksgiving that it was shot. I, I know you have a third uh, film planned in the trilogy. If you could kind of uh, mention that really quickly. Oh yeah. So it's the it's it's it's, it's the condemned, the captain, the third one. Of course, the third in the trilogy is always set in space. It is called the cosmonaut which is about uh, uh, Russian astronauts that, that, that go through time and end up in the Old West. Beautiful. So, of course, moving on from that, and again, a link to the, all the, uh, we'll link to the first one that's out in the show notes. Oh, I, I want to mention, though, that ending is insane. I'm not going to give spoilers, so I want people to watch it, but the ending of, of The Condemned, just like that cut to the last shot with the credits, I was, 
I was almost angry at you that it was over because I was like, like that oh, shot hit, and you. I was like, oh my god! And then the credits start rolling, and I'm like, fuck this! Like I can't believe this is over already. What the hell? So oh, I, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, yeah, I think that turned out really nice. Yeah. Oh, it did. It was like I was genuinely just like my mouth was dropped. I was like, oh my god, because I was like, no way, this is where it's going, and then that's where it went, and then uh, then it's over. So I'm I'm uh, I, I guess I'm blue balled until you come out with the second one. Finally, <laughs> I can see what else is going on there. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's so that's so kind. But moving on, uh, something that you've just started doing is you've started a blog. If you could kind of, I'm not going to try and pronounce it. So if you could uh, tell us about this new blog. Sure, sure. The blog is called. Uh, it's 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 a riff on on the novel and film Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, but my blog is called Tinker Tailor Solaire Spezio. <laughs> so it's about uh, uh, there's four. Those are all baseball player names. Uh, Tinker is a famous 19. 19- 19 like 1900s early 1900s uh chicago cub player uh taylor is could be any a number of taylors but chris taylor who plays for the dodgers solaire is uh jorge solaire who hit the game winning home run for the braves last year in the world series and then uh, scott spezio is this character from the cardinals from uh from a decade or so ago so uh, it's just like it's my blog where I write about baseball because I'm obsessed with baseball and how baseball shows up in pop culture, which is rock and roll songs, movies, books, anywhere that a lot of music, but anywhere baseball shows up outside of a stadium mm-hmm. um, and how that, you know, and how and my take on that, you know, baseball players doing acting. There's there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of ways it can go. I have also written about 40 pages about um uh, cemetery tourism. If you want to go see your favorite baseball players oh, and where they're buried, mm-hmm. I've written, <laughs> I've written about every state, what cemetery you would go to <laughs> That's in awesome. each state if you wanted to get the most bang for your buck. Um, so anyway, yeah, uh, I've been talking about uh, starting this blog for a, a year or two and I finally, finally had time to launch it last weekend. I commented on your post because I don't know anything about sports or baseball. Like I've, I've been to a couple baseball games. Like I know the, the general gist of it, but I was just really, uh, I really like, it, it, you know, it's, they're short read posts. They're not like super long. And you bring it again. It's, it's more about uh, the influence that that baseball has on pop culture rather than purely the baseball itself. So I think it's it's very uh, widely of interest to a lot of people, even if you're not into baseball, like I'm not really, I still really have enjoyed. And you put out a new post today too, that I, I, I didn't get to uh, fully read through it all yet, but I, I know it's about music, which is very, very interesting. So uh, anybody listening, they might be like, ah, baseball, who needs it? But like, there's, there's more to it than that. It's- yeah. It's, 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 it's written to be kind of an evergreen baseball blog. I'm not going to talk about yesterday's games or this year's playoffs or that kind of thing. I'm just talking about baseball history, baseball and pop culture, like these kinds of things and how we can kind of like take the baseball cosmos, the, 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 the the baseballism of everything and apply it to other parts of, of our experience and, and those kinds of things and learn things from it. I think that's, I think that's interesting. And I'm going to, I, I feel like I could write about it for the rest of my life. That's (laughs) my plan. The, the, the back door of all of this is that I've also written uh, a pilot script in the world of minor league baseball. Oh, okay. Uh, and it's uh, ostensibly about uh, a number one draft pick, like the first pick, the first overall pick. He's a can't miss major league baseball player, maybe a future Hall of Famer, a, a, a Chipper Jones type, um, who is gay and is going through the minor leagues, um, like not only coming out to the world because he's going to be super famous, but coming out to himself because as a 18 or 19 year old, you don't, you may not even know that about yourself, especially if you've been trained to do nothing but play baseball since you were eight years old, which is how you become a one, one draft pick anyway. Um, so I wrote that script uh, four or five years ago with a friend of mine. Um, uh, and so I kind of wrote the baseball stuff. He wrote the the gay stuff. Not really, but um, <laughs> but that's that was our partnership on this thing. Uh, and and the script is already a little out of date because minor league baseball keeps changing and baseball keeps changing. But I think it's a good script. I think it's interesting. And we already have like there's an arc to it of like season one is in single A and he's coming out to himself and double A, he's kind of coming out to the people around him and that doesn't go well. 
Um, so he has to find the hybrid of how that would work and then triple A and then the series ends when he finally makes it to the major league. Gotcha. Wow. That sounds really, really. And, and again, it, it kind of goes into, it's about baseball, but it's also about this uh, personal journey and, and, you know, baseball That's is right. kind of the backdrop of that. I assume ultimately. That's right. That's right. And minor league baseball to me is endlessly interesting because and it's like, it's about this main character, but it's also about all the people around him who are also working their way up through the minors. Cause it's not just the players who work their way up. The coaches work their way up the announcers, the greenskeepers, like the people who sell popcorn or whatever it is, everybody's kind of working their way up to the majors. So we have like three of the, three of the five main characters are women and their role in kind of working their way up to the majors in their own way. I think it's a really fun world. And, uh, you know, so anyway, writing the baseball blog is my way of being like, Oh, he's a baseball writer. And I've written this baseball script. Sure. Oh, that way. makes sense. So that makes sense. Write. That makes sense. Yeah. So, so moving on, because obviously there's a thousand other things you've been involved in. Like I know you've worked on the show Gravity Falls, which I'm not familiar with, but I know is a very big show, but I don't, you know, you've worked on Your Pretty Faces Going to Hell, lots of stuff. But what is something creative that you have not done yet, but that you would like to do? So, so not like direct the film or not like, you know, edit on whatever, but just something completely different that you've never done before that you still want to do. Um, well, um, the, I, I'm pretty happy with like I've kind of settled into focusing on editing since I've been in LA the last decade or so. And I've, uh, for the last year or so, uh, I've been working on an indie feature, um, which is really my favorite thing to do. Editing, editing features is kind of more satisfying than TV shows to me. It's number one, like it's just sexier, like no matter how good your TV show is when people are like, Oh, Oh, a movie like in theaters. Like it's just, it's just a bigger thing. Um, so I really love working on indie features. I've, I've, I've done a couple of those. I've, I've touched a couple of them, but, but this is one that I'm really heavily involved in. It's called uh, A Town Called Purgatory, and it's a horror Western. Um, and we hope to finish it by the end of the year. And it, 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 uh, we're going to look for distributors in the spring. Ooh, excellent. And, and excellent. Hopefully that'll be out. Yeah. So that's really fun. Have you seen the new Aqua Teen film, Plantasm? And if so, what are your thoughts on it? Or just what are your thoughts based on what you know? Uh, I've seen a few clips, um, uh, but I haven't really interacted with the film since uh, since I did a couple weeks of editing dialogue and then handed that off to to Ned Hastings, to who headed up the the, the main editing on and storyboard editing on it. So no, I'm I'm going to see it for the first time when the DV arrives in my house, when the Blu-ray arrives in my house. I'll be interested to hear your thoughts on that because it seems like uh, it's going in a, in a, a more uh, traditional film direction than something like the 2007 film which was kind of like a long episode that you guys worked on for two years this seems to be a little bit more focused so i'm really excited to see that aspect of it it's bonkers if it i'm sure it's changed a lot since the script that i saw but it is bonkers and super fun and going to be very very funny excellent I'm, 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 I'm positive i know that you are really into music and i've heard you talk about like discogs and stuff in, in previous uh interviews i've listened to you in I was wondering if you could tell me about the most obscure record in your collection. Oh, I just got it. The, the, and it changes like week to week because I'm because because the idea of Discogs for me was and during the pandemic, I'm going to log in all my records and get rid of the ones that I don't listen to anymore because I've been carrying around all my records since high school. Um, so I got a lot of old punk rock records that I don't listen to anymore, even though I still love that stuff. It's like, why am I still carrying this around? Someone else should be able to enjoy it. And I should get some money for that. It's fair. It seems like a fair trade. Um, so uh, the plan was to thin the record collection, but unfortunately, Discogs also allows you to make a wish list <laughs> of records that you want. I know. So I it's, know. <laughs> it's been a next. It's been a net gain of records. Yeah. So, of course. Uh, I have to limit myself to what kind of records I'm collecting. So right now, I'm only collecting Halloween records. So like songs about Frankenstein or Dracula or monsters. Um, of which I have a fuck ton at this point. Like, <laughs> I'd imagine, yes. It's getting really. I'm I'm like a Halloween DJ waiting to happen. <laughs> um, uh, and the other records that I collect are twist records mm. or songs that weren't the twist, which are my favorite twist records, like <laughs> the Frug and the Holly Gully and the Horse and whatever. I love records. Like there's a there's <laughs> there's one like anti twist record called the Freeze, where you just stand still. It's my favorite dance record where the dance instructions are to not move. Um, 
So I love that stuff. That's such an interesting period because it's like people were uh, unabashedly trying to rip off each other and trying to like do the same exact thing, but in slightly different ways. Yeah. And culture moved at such a different pace. So like the twist as a dance craze was not like one summer. It was like two years of a dance craze that was the twist and it just wouldn't die. So until the Beatles showed, I'm getting in the weeds, but until the Beatles showed up in 64, like writing the next dance song that's going to replace the twist was the main impetus for the music industry. And I love that. In a lot Uh of ways, the Beatles ruined music. I just dropped a pen. (laughs) In a lot of ways, the Beatles ruined 60s music for me, even though I also love the Beatles. Um, So to answer your question, uh, I got a, a a great record called The Frito Twist, which is a twist record about Fritos corn chips. No, from I was, the I, 60s. <laughs> I, I was like, no way, it's going to be about the chips. No way, it's going to be about the oh, yeah. chips, and it's about the fucking oh, yeah. chips. <laughs> the Frito Twist. My name is Joe, and I agree with Bill. When you want the blues to blow. You just can't stand still. You do it like this. The Frito Twist. What yeah. the fuck? Yeah. Wow. That's I bought insane. two copies. I've actually bought two copies of it because <laughs> the first copy was was unlistenable. Oh god. Okay. Wow. That's a bummer. Yeah. Yeah. So there's like two copies of that song on listed for eBay. List on eBay right now. There's my copy, which is like 99 cents because it's not really playable. And there's another copy for like a hundred bucks. Um, I actually, because I know I knew you were into records. I actually brought down my my most obscure record. I'd like to show it to you really quick. Oh, please! Obviously, this will not translate well to an audio only podcast about Aqua Teen Hunger Force, but this is what I'm interested in. So, uh, I am. I know you're into like garage rock and stuff. I am into. I don't know how well you can see it, but I am into Japanese '80s ambient music, and I've got oh, a interesting, a pretty interesting record here that this is not a sleeve. It is actually a booklet full of like beautiful images and, and, oh, yeah. and all sorts of things. And it's um, very relaxing. Yeah. And you kind of hit the nail on the head because the reason this is obscure on the picture disc, I'll show it to you here. It says not for sale. And oh, the reason yeah. that is, is because they didn't sell these. These, I, I would like to tell you, were given away with a brand of luxury air conditioners in in Japan. I love it. I love it. And it's a whole booklet of beautiful pictures, you know, picture disc. The first side is all ambient music. The second side is like uh, the sound of like waves in the ocean and then like rainforest sounds. Uh, have you seen the documentary Bullet uh, Bathtubs over Broadway? No, no. What's it's that about? On Net- I believe it's on Netflix. Uh, it's about um, one of the head writers of Letterman, uh, who used to do a segment on Letterman called "What's in Dave's Record Collection," and he'd go around New York finding weird, like records, and he fell in love with corporate musicals. So, like, for like. Goodyear Tires would do a sales presentation, would do a sales convention for their whole workforce Mm -hmm. in Dayton, Ohio or something. And for this like convention, they'd bring in performers and put on a musical about Goodyear Tires. What the hell? (laughs) And then sometimes they would print the album of this one time corporate musical. Okay. So that became like an obsession of this head writer for Letterman to kind of like, because Dave's segment was, what's in Dave's record collection? He'd hold up the record and play a clip and it'd be funny and goofy. But this writer became obsessed with these corporate musical records and started collecting them and tracking down the people who produced them. Oh, wow. So it sounds like it's right up your alley. Both yeah. uh, Bathtubs over Broadway. Yeah, I'll write that down. Uh, it's a doc. It's really great. Thank you for entertaining uh, this record talk with me because I don't have a whole lot of people in my life that I can talk about records with, as well as Aqua Teen. I'm with you. So I just I have kind of a rapid fire questions for you really quickly. Just uh, some of your favorite things. So what is your favorite band and or album? 
Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> I know, I, know um, it would be. I really, okay. Okay. Uh, I think my favorite band is probably the Sonics, which is kind of the center of the bullseye garage rock band. They're from Seattle from the early, late fifties, early sixties. And I can distinctly remember the first time I ordered like a reprint of one of their albums on CD in the early, late, late nineties, early two thousands from Crypt Records when they used to have a printed catalog. And I got the CD and I was like repainting a bathroom in my house. And like every song that came on that album was just blowing my mind with three chord distorted garage chords. And every song was just, just just incredible. So I, like if I had to pick one band, it'd be the Sonics. And they actually did a reunion tour for the first time in like 30 years. Oh, wow. Probably around 2000, late, like between 2005 and 2010. And so their like reunion show was um, in Brooklyn. So a girlfriend and I at the time went up and saw them play a couple times. And, you know, these are guys like in their late 60s, early 70s, if not mid 70s at the time. And they were out playing the same guitars, screaming in the same way. Like the this um, Jerry, uh, I think his, his name is the singer, who has just this blood curdling scream that's just so evocative. Anyway, let's go listen to the Sonics. Knock your doors off. Anyway, like they came out and played their first song, and the crowd was older, but still there was a bit of a mosh pit. They were completely blown away by the reception. Like they were they were dumbfounded oh, by wow. this sold out like it was like in a vfw hall in brooklyn um you know what i mean and they were just blown away by the reception because people went nuts hearing those songs played live for the first time in their lives and it really was like incredible incredible so anyway the sonics i love i could i could go on and on gotcha is there a song by them anybody should check out specifically i I think if i think if i had to if I had to like list my favorite song, it would be Louie Louie, which is all, which they do a cover of, but I love the original Louie Louie, um, baseball thing, bring it back to baseball. Yeah. The original Louie Louie, which was, uh, I'm going to blank on the guy's name who performed it. Anyway, the original Louie Louie was performed by a black kind of duo group from Los Angeles. And one of the backup singers on the original Louie Louie recording is a guy named Lee May who went on to play professional baseball. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. crazy. Lee May played a couple years in the majors, played next to Hank Aaron for the Brewers, and put out, you know, a dozen or two dozen singles uh, in his life as a as a singer. It's always cool, yeah, to see when people who are, uh, you know, big in one field go to something completely different and are able to, uh, you know, do pretty well there as well. Yeah, crazy. So moving on, what is your favorite film and or television show? Um. I, I, I have a couple. I really love John Carpenter's The Thing. It's like a perfect movie. But, you know, my go-to answer for my brand when it comes to my favorite film is a, a Roger Corman movie called It Conquered the World. I have a tattoo of the monster from It Conquered the World. That's something I want to mention to the, to, to the uh, listeners that you are uh, quite a tatted up man. I've seen some pictures of your tattoos online. Which, uh, you know, f- from your portrayal in the episode, The, you wouldn't expect, because in that episode, you're, you're very uh, uh, straightforward. But that was pre that was pre uh, pre pre most of my tattoos. Yeah. Like like in, in your uh, in your uh, uh, Stomp Shout Scream blog, you, you talk about how you got this like big Frankenstein tattoo on you as well. You're, you're a very tatted gentleman. I am. I am. Like, like the, the when, when I found out Korenstein was happening, I contacted the the filmmaker who I know from Atlanta. I was like, you can't not have me involved in this <laughs> i i deserve to be on this sir i'm kind of a frankenstein <laughs> filmmaker nerd so yeah he was kind enough to let me do some in credit stuff which is just me playing frankenstein uh would you like to uh shout out a favorite television show or is it too hard to pick oh um i no i i, I have one of those too um like i feel like when people are like how like what makes you a good editor? And I think part of what makes me a good editor is that I watched a lot of television as a child instead of going outside to play. 
Um, and the TV that I watched as a child, the show that I watched as a child more than any other is the Dick Van Dyke show, which is just kind of a masterclass of how to tell jokes and comedy and timing. Um, Cause it's like, you've got Maury Amsterdam, who's like the borscht belt, sticky, like one liner comedian. And then you've got Rob and Laura who are more like set up punchline um, kind of stuff. Cause it's a TV show about writing comedy. Um, and Mary Tyler Moore is like, like the greatest sixties icon in television. Um, so I love the Dick Van Dyke show. So I feel like watching that, watching reruns of that over and over and over again made me a better editor. Sure. Yeah. I would so, imagine. So if I'm going to say favorite TV show, I'll, I'll go with that one. What is your favorite book? Oh, um, it's a baseball book, but it's a book that anyone can read. It's called Bottom of the 33rd, and it's a book about the longest baseball game in history. And it's a triple-A game from the early 90, early 80s um, between two teams in the Northeast. And it was a weird rule that got, that got accidentally left out of the rule book that enabled this game to go 33 innings. Like, it went overnight. <laughs> like, it went from 7 p.m. to, like, 4 a.m. And it went 33 innings. Um, and then they finally called it for time and then finished the game like a, a couple months later. But anyway, it's called Bottom of the 33rd. Uh, but the author profiles every player in the game and every like, there's like 12 people that stayed in the stands for the whole game. He interviews every one of them. Oh, wow. Through telling the story of this game, he does – it's almost like Lost – where you go on these extended um, stories of each player, of each manager, of each coach, of each person in the stands. And it's just a magical story about American life. Um, it's just an incredible book. Anyway, Bottom of the 33rd. That's probably my favorite book. That sounds very, very, very interesting. Yeah. I'll have to check that out. Uh, favorite food? Oh, um, favorite food. I live in LA, so it's easy to say tacos. There you go. Um, I can never say no to uh, a French fries um, because you can, because I never get full. Like I never get full. I can eat French fries like 24 hours a day and I never <laughs> feel like I was getting full. There's always room for a couple more French fries. Uh, I have a problem where that mechanism that tells you when you're full doesn't work for Does, me. Yeah, and sure. I overeat. <laughs> if there's something delicious, I will overeat. So that's a problem. Um, but knowing that doesn't stop it. It still happens. Um, like I can't say no to any Italian food, like literally any Italian food, pasta, pizza, and pasta mm -hmm. and pizza. Yeah. Uh, favorite food, like my very favorite food. Like it's your birthday and you can have whatever you want. What are you asking for? It's, it's kind of my hobby. Um, I love a, a, a pulled pork barbecue sandwich. With oh coleslaw. yes. Yes. Yeah. Me too. And so that's my hobby in LA is, is, is making barbecue. So I will spend thousands of dollars and hours of time to make myself <laughs> one Pulled pork barbecue sandwich. Uh -huh. I, I, I heard you in a, another podcast talking about making like carnitas and uh, yeah, and how you were like draining this boar's leg like in your uh, in your tub at the time. That's and all right, this crazy yeah, yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah I like <laughs> uh, when I lived in Atlanta. My my father had a hunting camp in Florida, but his buddies would hit hunt wild boar, and they'd always have extra wild boar. So I'd get wild boar and try to and make barbecue out of it which is a real challenge because it's really lean and kind of tough and gamey. So you had to like freeze it and drain it, a certain, drain the blood out of it in a certain way. So it was like a whole like week long process. So yeah. Yeah. I, I like, I like cooking is, is, is a, is a hobby of mine. Anything that takes a very long time I'm into. <laughs> right on. Uh, the opposite of that. I'd like to ask since you worked on Aqua Teen Hunger Force is what is your favorite fast food restaurant? I, I I went like a decade without eating fast food because it's just so unhealthy. As you should. <laughs> yeah, so unhealthy for you. But the pandemic ended that because like sometimes you just got to get out of the house for no reason and then a drive through just sounds like the best possible thing. Um, yeah, like in LA, it's like you could get tacos on every corner and they're 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 just delicious. Favorite fast food? If I'm going to go with a national fast food, like a chain, chain yeah, like a big chain, yeah. Um, I gotta say like. Fat burger is maybe my favorite cheeseburger. Oh, I never heard of that. And maybe it's an LA thing. Like I'm not, I'm, I'm not sold on in and out burger like everyone else is out here. Yeah, people seem to love that out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Fat burger is a really good, really good burger. You know, you can't go wrong with like a del. You know what? You know what's good? A del taco taco. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. del taco's got a little more variety than Taco Bell. Mm, yeah. Um, also, like if you're really like 
if you really want to dig in to a shitty fast food meal that's delicious, is just a McDonald's single cheeseburger. Yep, I'm with you. Yeah, which is just yeah. meat, gristle, and cheese, and ketchup, and stale bread. It's very satisfying. It's the perfect balance of like salty and savory and sweet. Yeah, you can't go wrong. Yeah, with that. yeah. You don't go to McDonald's for a good burger. You go to them for a shitty burger like that, and you know what you're going to get, and you love it. Every it's the same time. every time. It's very satisfying. Yeah. 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 So uh, yeah. my last rapid fire question for you, and you're probably going to hate me for this one, but what is your favorite beer? I'm ruining your rapid fire questions because I talk so much. <laughs> no, like, I it's can't rapid on my part. You can take story. as long as you want. You take as long as you want. I can't help but like weave a, a beginning, <laughs> middle, and end to every sentence, to every question of yours. I, 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 it looks to me like on screen, like you're writing occasionally. I have to imagine you're writing script ideas now based on your answers. I, I'm, 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 I'm dotting, I'm jotting notes down so I don't interrupt you and can remember what I'm supposed to talk about. So a uh, uh, favorite beer, favorite beer. Right now, my favorite beer is um, is the uh, a, a nut brown ale from Central California. I think it's called the Double Nut Brown. Um, I'm blanking on the brewery. For all the beer heads out there, I did follow up with Jay on this. The brewery is Mammoth, so the full title on this beer is the Mammoth Double Nut Brown Ale. But it's really good. It's like the perfect like cooking beer, drinking beer. Like I live in, I live in a, a, a beer zone that is anti to my particular beer taste, which I don't like IPAs or pale ales. And Southern California is just it's useless. Like I'll go into a bar that'll have like twenty one beers on tap, and nineteen of them will be IPAs and pale ales, and the other ones a pilsner, and the other ones a lager. I'm like, give me a brown ale, a scotch ale, a stout. There's like 17 different flavors of stout. Just give me something that's not that one. And, you know, I've had, you know, I, you know, I'm kind of like trying to get into like juicy Northeastern style IPAs because they're not as hoppy. They're a little more juicy. And like a grapefruit IPA makes sense to me because grapefruit, if you bite into like the pith of a grapefruit, it's got that bitterness. So that makes sense. But pine, like, piney ipas that just tastes like you're licking a pine tree i don't <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm with you i don't get I'm with it you. ruins my palate for anything else um so yeah like a good brown ale like a dry irish stout like there's a good brewery out here called mcleod that just opened a brewery in my neighborhood that i'm excited about um i got into sours for a while but then they started tasting all the same so i'm kind of over the sour phase and plus it's just too acidic for most people's systems so yeah like i like a good stout i like a good barrel aged sipping 12 percent, 16 percent beer are you, are you still a, a silent owner of l yeah uh no no i i was a beer professional for about uh five six years but when i moved to california um i was still a, a like a silent partner which was what i signed up to be in the first place but but there's but i but but I, but i've i've sold my my part my part of that okay um, gotcha but they're still going strong so yeah go support ale yeah in decatur georgia they're they're nice guys and literally the best the best beer selection in town i actually i had a segment planned when we first got on this call i bought a, a mystery pack of beer i was going to show you and have you pick for me but i was like i didn't know how long i'd have you for so i'm like i don't want to use five minutes of our time <laughs> picking a beer so uh but uh yeah obviously you are very into beer and and uh i like beer i'm not super knowledgeable about it though so i can't go too far into it but i i, I listened to your performance on the uh i think it's called like the the rock and roll beer oh, guy God, podcast yeah. and that was very interesting yeah that's a friend of mine he, he does uh he does great stuff he interviews heavy metal bands and drinks beer with them. Yeah, well, that's the thing is he had great like Aqua Teen questions for you like that I haven't heard asked before. But also you guys had just great conversations on beer. And it's something I need to uh, continue to dive into a little bit more. Well, thank you for doing your extensive research on my life. <laughs> well, well, uh, for my day job, I, I work at Target. Like I just like stock shelves at Target. So I have unlimited podcast listening time. So I was just listening to everything you've been on and just I, I literally... Uh, where is it? I keep a notepad in my pocket and I pull it out whenever I have a thought for the podcast. I write it down. So I was able to uh, do a lot of research there. Well, thanks for watching my stuff. Like it's so often when you're a filmmaker and, and that kind of thing, you you put stuff out in the world and, and it feels like the world says, huh, and then moves on. 
So thank you so much for for watching and saying nice things about it. That that means a lot. I didn't I didn't know if this would be inappropriate to ask, but like the rating on on uh, Stomp Shout Scream is is like a four point four out of ten on IMDb, and like having seen that, I'm like, wow, that movie probably sucks. But when you watch it, it's a perfectly fun time. So I'm kind of wondering how you how you feel about that, like just ratings and stuff in yeah, general. Yeah, I made a beach party rock and roll monster movie in the same style as '60s beach party movies. So if you don't know that or get that going into it it just feels like a bad movie i think in fact i'm i'm almost positive of that (laughs) so but if you get the references if you go if you get what i'm going for which is that style of movie it 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 kind of nails it and that now that gives me excuse for making to, to to make a movie that's not as good as it possibly could be maybe maybe i'm giving myself an out for not making as a writing a better script or <laughs> making a better movie, but it is in the style of, of those sixties beach party movies. And, and if you like those movies or you appreciate them in any way, it kind of nails it. Sure. But if you don't, if you don't, the movie mm-hmm. makes no sense. Well, I, yeah, I guess for me, like I knew the context of the film going into it. Like I don't watch like beach party movies. I've never seen one in my life, but like I knew who you were. I knew who the people involved were. So I knew what to expect because like, I guess if you're expecting an actual, like, horror film and then suddenly the skunk ape jumps up while the band's playing and he's dancing along with the crowd that you might be like what the fuck is happening but for me knowing like that you are approaching all these different kind of genres of film i can still laugh at that but also be kind of like wow like there's like actual gore and death in this film but also just silly kind of moments it's just all over the place but i think for me in a way that works but yeah i guess uh for the average viewer if they don't know what's happening then they're just going to be lost right right it 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 yeah it doesn't it like if you're going in for a horror movie it's not a horror movie if you're going in for like a musical it's not a musical it's not a comedy it's not a straight comedy you know so it's everything almost I, it's it, <laughs> it's the movie that i wanted to make that i could make and i wanted to make at the time so so yeah i'm 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 proud of it in that way i tried to watch it last week and I couldn't get through it. Really? Yeah, I like you can, I can't watch my own stuff. Uh, I guess that makes sense. Yeah, I, I just know it too. I just know it too well, and 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 just can't think. I'm just constantly thinking about what I would have done differently. Well, of course. Uh, thank you so much, Jay, for doing this. Honestly, it's just been one of the best days of my life to be able to talk to you. Because, like I said, I was a little kid. Oh, that's so nice. I was a little kid watching your work and and just loving it. So it's just crazy that I'm able to. Uh, have uh, this relationship with you where I can chat with you here and and message you. I really do appreciate it. Like I said, because of you, my podcast is better. Uh, I will let you go here. Unless there's anything else that you want to say that you would like to discuss that you don't think we've touched on. I've got one last story for you. I knew, I didn't know, but I realized Aqua Teen had become kind of a thing in like 2003 or 2004. I flew from Atlanta to Los Angeles and rented a car and handed over my ID. And the guy looks at my ID to rent my car. He's like, do you work on Aqua Teen? I was like, what? He's like, yeah, you got the same name as the guy who works on Aqua Teen. I was like, how do you know that? It was like, your name comes up third in the credits and I watch it constantly. So I see your name every time I watch the show. I was like, yeah, yeah, I work on Aqua Teen. He's like, oh, that's cool. Nice to meet you. And that was like 2003, 2004. There you have it, my conversation with Jay. And you might be sitting there screaming into your phone, Ronnie, you freaking dummy, you numb nuts. You didn't even ask him about his performance in the episode, The. You didn't ask him some other stuff. Well, guess what? Hey, first of all, stop being so aggressive with me. This is a free podcast and just enjoy what you get. But I did ask him other things about Aqua Teen that I will be sprinkling throughout the appropriate episodes. So, for example, next week when we cover the episode The, which Jay stars in as himself, I will play some more of our interview there because it's a bit more applicable there. And also, Jay and I did discuss early Aqua Teen and like the Baffler Meal script and, and that Baffler Meal Space Ghost episode. We talked about that too, but that will be in my coverage of the Baffler Meal episode whenever that comes out on the Patreon. So there is a bit more here. And then also I edit out a bunch of stuff. And if you are a patron at some point, I don't have a timeline on this, but at some point I will upload a more complete conversation, one that isn't so edited because I tried to keep the flow and everything going, but we did discuss a little bit more than is even here and that I am going to replay. So if you're a patron, you'll get to hear all that at some point. 
But yes, that was my conversation with Jay. It was just, like I said uh, previously in the interview, it was one of the best days of my life. It was awesome. Jay's just the coolest fucking guy. Even besides Aqua Teen, I just love talking to him about music and film and even beer. You know, he's, he's very knowledgeable in beer. I need his guidance. So I'll probably be hitting him up about that in the future as well. But yeah, I would love to talk to him again, even just about whatever. He's so cool and like I said at the beginning of this episode, it just makes me love this show so much more because the people involved behind it are really just solid guys that that uh, they're very creative. They just want to make good stuff that people like. Very humble. They're not full of themselves. And, and Jay's just a great example of that. And I really like talking to him. Again, you can find him on Twitter and Instagram at Edwards. Links to basically everything we talked about will be in the show notes. He has a, a 2018 short film called The Condemned you can watch for free on Vimeo. He has his 2005 film Stomp Shout Screen. Like I said, I just watched it so many times leading up to the interview. And I'm going to watch it many more times. It's just such a fun movie. Really check it out. If you like Aqua Dean, check out that film. It's a great time. And he has his new baseball blog. Check that out. Again, it's not purely about baseball. It's it's centered on baseball, but uh, I enjoy it and I don't even like baseball. So I think you will too. So again, links to everything in the show notes. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for listening because if there was no audience here, then I wouldn't have had a reason to talk to Jay. And of course, thank you to those who support this podcast. It means the world to me. If you don't mind, I gotta shout out the homies, the number one in the Hood G tier patrons, Sean, Ian, Keenan, Captain Buford, Brian, Robison, Carl, and Reverend Raven 46. You guys can make my dreams come true any day of the week. I'll see you next week when we jump into the episode, the, the episode, of course, again, that J. Wade Edwards starred in as himself and also edited. It's a great episode. I hope you're looking forward to it. Bye-bye. When something like this new box set comes out, do you receive like more royalties for this or no? Oh, fuck no.